Oh, okay, well, welcome and um, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me here. Um, of course, it's a, it's a Humboldt event, so obviously my answer was yes, because it's really uh, my favorite uh, found science foundation that there is, because it's, uh, uh, it's, its attitude and, and the way it is funding science is, is really uh, quite unique and very liberal, actually. Now, today I will speak about, not about atoms, so I move away even further from cold atoms, uh, but I take a similar journey than, than Tillman, I go to warmer temperatures in the end. And so I will speak about, um, I will speak about uh, quantum simulators, and uh, there is a problem with the resolution here. Um, well, well, let's see. I mean, okay, you're only, you're only missing the headings. It's not so bad, perhaps. Um, so, and I'm going to talk about quantum simulation. And so, in, in fact, more specifically, I talk about quantum simulation of 2D uh, quantum systems. So, why is that actually? So, why do I not focus on 1D or, or 3D or something like that? So, first of all, um, 2D systems actually offer a, a whole range of, of interesting uh, phenomena, so these include anions, uh, topological phase transitions, um, various quantum phase transitions that are based on frustration, and uh, they also have an application in, in um, quantum error correction, so where they enable surface code. So they actually open a whole broad range of, of physics that is not available in 1D and may also in some cases not be available in 3D. <coughs> So the other point is that we could, uh, we could look at one-dimensional systems, and at 1D systems, we actually have very good uh, classical simulation algorithms. So if you're looking for the ground state of a many-body Hamiltonian uh, in a 1D system, we can typically compute this very, very accurately and very efficiently using a, um, a classical computer. And this is, this is really not the case for a 2D system. So there we have problems and there are many challenging questions that we would love to answer for maybe a lattice of, of only 10 by 10 fermions or, or, or spin systems. And it's already really not possible to obtain these answers on a classical computer with any kind of efficiency. So here uh, we are really lacking also classical methods for simulation. And so therefore, this is actually a good area to try and build a quantum simulation device. Yeah? So we're going for two dimensions. So two dimensions, well, I mean, we are not the first ones to even think about that. There's, of course, a lot of uh, wonderful physics that is being explored um, to try and create, two, in a very controlled way, 2D quantum systems. So here's an example. This would be trapped ions, so this is a whole crystal of ions in a panning trap that is actually rotating around the, very rapidly around the axis that is vertical to the, to the plane of the projection here. And you see that you, you, have, a, you have a photograph here and this, you see that you have, a, you have a lattice structure here. And actually in this lattice structure you can create some interactions. But this is a system where you have to keep the atoms in ultra cold environments, so micro-Kelvin or so, laser-cooled. They have to be in, a, in an ultra-high vacuum and also in many other ways shielded very well. And here it's uh, also a wonderful example of ultra-cold atoms dropped into a, um, an optical lattice. And they will also form a lattice structure where the atoms arrange themselves in periodic patterns and they can be made to interact. And this is a system that is, that is even colder, so it's, it's more like nano-Kelvin temperatures, and again, it's an ultra-high vacuum. So all of these have in common that you have to actually make already a great effort to actually hold the particles together, and if you, for example, switch off the electricity in your lab, the whole thing will vanish in, a, in an instant. So I was thinking, well, is there actually a way to do the same thing at room temperature, potentially? And, uh, but for doing so, you need a new material. So now you need to go away from ultra-high vacuum and all these things and trapping, and you need to, need to do something different. And for that, we go to, uh, for the raw material, we go here. This is Sotheby's, an auction house in London. And uh, in this auction house, actually as a tourist advice, whenever you're in London, 
don't go to the big galleries, also check out what they have, because you see wonderful art pieces that are then sold off to very, very, very rich people, and they keep it in the living room, and you will never see them again in your lifetime, possibly. So you see wonderful pieces of art here, and the second thing is, it's free. So you can just go in there, walk in there, and look at all the artwork that is then in a week later or sold off. But in any case, so I went there in uh, October 2016 also, and um, there you see the following thing, or I was seeing the following thing, so I, um, I took a photograph of it. This is a diamond. It's a perfect diamond. So and that means that actually you don't see much of it uh, because it does not absorb light and it does not emit light because it has a very large uh, energy gap of five and a half electron volts. So what you see is actually the reflection of light on the surfaces that have been cut very carefully. And uh, so this is a wonderful piece. So, I mean, it costs an unbelievable amount of money. It belonged to apparently the Russian uh, czars at the time. So uh, here uh, I walked a little bit further, another meter or so, and then I saw this diamond, actually much more expensive than this one. And you see it's not quite perfect. You can see a little bit of color here. And uh, so I spoke to the curator of the, of the exhibition, and he actually knew uh, the origin of color, because uh, the, the origin of color is lattice imperfections in the diamond. So I told him a bit about quantum technologies, and uh, well, I hope that he used it for his customers later on, uh, making it even more attractive to buy these, these devices. But uh, in any case, so this shows you here that there's a perfect and imperfect diamond. So as I said, the, the, the structure of the diamond, so the color, comes from lattice defects. And of particular interest for us is, a, is this lattice defect. So we have a carbon, the diamond lattice here, and here we have a carbon atom that has been substituted by a nitrogen atom. And the neighboring carbon atom has been knocked out and there is a vacancy. And so this system has now free electron bonds, dangling bonds, and these dangling bonds, they can lead to absorption and re-emission of light if the energy levels lying are lying in between the energy gap. And five and a half electron is a very large energy gap, so actually this system here has a typical energy, energy scale between one and two electron volts, so it lies firmly inside of this energy gap. And so therefore, what you see as color in, in this particular diamond is actually the absorption and emission from these little color centers here. So this is a nice aspect, but an even more nice aspect is that we have these elect free electron bonds, so they form actually in this case an electron system with spin 1. So the, in the ground state you have three energy levels, the m equals 0 and the m equals plus and minus 1. And they are split, even at zero external field, by the self-interaction of the, uh, of the uh, electrons uh, with each other. And, of course, what that means is that here we have now these magnetic quantum numbers, and if we apply a magnetic field, then these levels will shift. Now, how do we measure that? Well, we scatter light. And the, light, the scattering intensity, or scattering cross-section, actually depends on whether you are in the state m equals zero, or in this state m equals plus and minus one. So in this way, you can find out what is going on in the system. And so, therefore, you can actually measure also very small magnetic fields and you can start to interact with other particles. So, for example, electron or nuclear spins on the outside that create a magnetic field at the position of the NV center. This will only work when the systems are very close together, of course, only a few nanometers or so. But when this is the case, then you can actually really measure the interaction with even a single nuclear spin. And so, this is what I would like to kind of uh, exploit now. Um, and to do so, first, I would like to now arrange a, a regular 2D lattice of nuclear spins, but in such a way that I don't need vacuum and, and uh, trapping forces and so on to hold them together. And one way that is anyway done with these diamonds is that typically they clean the surfaces very uh, carefully. Uh, that means they subject them to all sorts of acids, they boil them for an hour in some acids or so. So if you apply, for example, hydrofluoric acid here, then in the end product will be that you have a diamond surface and on top of the surface, each carbon atom will be bound to exactly one fluorine atom. And so you will get a two-dimensional lattice, which can be a, a triangular lattice, a square lattice, or when you take graphene, you get a graphene-type double lattice, 
where the atoms are held together in place with a lattice constant of only two and a half angstrom. And that has as, uh, as the result that the interaction between the fluorine atoms is actually not very weak at all anymore. It's about seven kilohertz, which is quite long, uh, taking account of the fact that lifetimes of or polarization lifetimes, for example, of such nuclear spins in bulk can be a much, much longer, can be in the second or even much longer range. So this strong interaction is owed to the fact that unlike an optical lattice and iron trap, we are about 10,000 times closer together. And that gives an, 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 an increase, a factor of increase here. So that's fine. Um, now another structure that you can think of is that you grow a diamond, you grow first carbon-12, then you grow a very thin layer of carbon-13, and then you cap it off again with a layer, thick layer of carbon-12. So basically to insulate this carbon-13 layer, which has nuclear spins in it, with nuclear spin-free materials. Yeah? So like in a thermal flask, so to speak, so it interacts with nothing else but itself, actually. So these carbon-13 atoms will interact with each other. So how do you now control this system? Because now you have a real problem because you have the system, it's great, it's a few hundred or a few thousand spins, but first you have to prepare them in a low entropy initial state, secondly you have to control the dynamics, and thirdly, very difficult also, you have to read out the quantum state of those systems, and you cannot take them and put them into an NMR machine because this is far too few spins to be detected in an NMR device. There you need 10 to the, t 10 to the 12 fully polarized spins to get a signal that you can measure. And here you only have a few hundred or a few thousand, so you need to do something else. And the something else is that we actually imagine that we put a color center very close to the surface, a few nanometers below the surface, so that it can actually interact with these nuclear spins. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the idea behind it, but the question is how does this work in detail? And the first thing that I have to show you is very briefly how you actually make an electron spin talk to a, to a nuclear spin and exchange energy. Because that's not an obvious thing, because the electron spin will have an energy scale that is a thousand times larger than that of a nuclear spin in the same external magnetic field. So you have to somehow intervene to make these energy scales equal. So classically speaking, what you would do is, you would take the electron spin and you flip it about periodically, or you rotate it with a certain frequency, such that this frequency matches the Larmor frequency of the nuclear spins. And if you achieve this, then you have a resonance, and you can expect that energy transfer can happen. And mathematically, you, this ex is expressed by the fact that you have here a continuous microwave driving field that makes transitions on the electron spin, so you flip it around. And you do this with a certain intensity, and uh, this leads to a Rabi frequency of this, of this drive, which is the square root of the intensity. And if you diagonalize the whole system, then you will find that you get new eigenstates that are split in energy by exactly the Rabi frequency of the microwave drive. So you can adjust it to the splitting of the target nuclear spins, in our case, the fluorine atoms. And you can see also that uh, the superposition, that you get two states, superposition states, either uh, negative uh, phase or the uh, positive phase between the two states. So that's basically the first step. So you can see now that uh, we can play the following game. We shine first a laser pulse onto the NV center, and it turns out, and this is something that I cannot explain very easily why this is, but, but you can actually get polarization of the electron spin following an, uh, uh, a laser pulse. So some color centers have this property, others don't. But in this case, it's a really nice, at room temperature, a microsecond long laser pulse polarizes the electron spin to about 90% uh, polarization. So then we make a pi half rotation because we are sitting here initially, and we move it to the lower dress state. And then we switch on, we keep on this microwave drive such that we have this resonance condition, and now they can actually really exchange um, excitations, and even more so, they can exchange entropy. So because if both spins, electron spin and nuclear spin, are pointing down, then by energy conservation nothing can happen. If the electron spin points down and the nuclear spin points up, then they can flip. 
So as a result, initially all the entropy might have been here, but afterwards all the entropy is in the electron spin, or some of it has been transferred there. And then we clean up this entropy again by a laser pulse and repeat the procedure. And in this way, we can actually really polarize the nuclear spin um, system to a high entropy itself. And so the question, of course, is does this work? And here's an experiment, so we can see that. Uh, so here we have an NV center. And if you just take natural diamond, it has 1% carbon-13 in it. So we have a lot of carbon-13 nuclei surrounding the NV center. And then we run exactly the protocol that I've shown you a few hundred times. And uh, we actually look at the nuclear spins surrounding it. And again, here, how do we measure that they are polarized? In this case, we look actually at the electron spin transition um, between the lower state and the upper state. And as I told you, this depends on the magnetic field that the NV center feels. And the magnetic field is generated by the, by the nuclei. So if they're all polarized in every experiment that I do, then it's always going to be the same magnetic field on the position of the NV center. If, however, the nuclei are not polarized, then in every experiment they might take a random orientation and sometimes the spin that is a bit closer is pointing up and the one that is farther is pointing down or the other way around. And that affects the magnetic field here. So in every experiment, you would see a different magnetic field. That means you will measure a different transition frequency on the electron spin resonance line and therefore you see a broadening. And so from measuring the broadening or the absence of it, you can actually infer the spin polarization of the nuclear spins here. So that was part of the experiment and it worked very well. And um, it worked very well because we had everything under extreme control and it was a relatively quick experiment. But often in these experiments, what you will have is that your microwave source will have a little bit of intensity fluctuations. You might lose your alignment a little bit. And so you cannot actually control the microwave frequency to a very, very high degree. And now the question is, what do you do? Either you have to put in more effort in your experiment, align everything better and so on, or buy a better microwave source, spending more money, or you actually think what you can do with the same microwave source by changing its dynamics a little bit. And so to see how we can do this, let's have a look again at this uh, system here. So we have here the electron system and it's driven and it creates these stress states. And if the, if the intensity here is fluctuating, then the energy spacing between those um, levels will actually fluctuate in time. So um, what, what can I do now? Well, I can actually try and introduce another drive exactly in this transition here and form a new stress state picture. And in this stress state picture, I become insensitive to fluctuations of the first order stress states because uh, of the driving. And I have still have the first order drive which establishes the resonance with the, with, the, with the nuclear spins. So what does that mean actually? In the original picture, that actually means that I have a primary drive and I have two additional drives, left and right, so to speak, red and blue detuned, and they're detuned exactly by the Rabi frequency of the first order drive. And so even simpler expressed, I make an amplitude or a phase modulation of my driving field. And in doing so, I actually gain stability against fluctuations in the amplitude of the field. And so this is very simple, very nice. It's the same microwave source. You just put two sidebands and it becomes much more stable. And to show you the effect, here we have done an experiment. So we have taken um, nuclear spins surrounding the NV center and we drove the NV center very hard. And in this case, we wanted to decouple the NV center from all the nuclear spins. So we took a, chose a very hard, very high Rabi frequency. 40 megahertz. And this microwave source had about a part in a thousand fl intensity fluctuations. And that translated actually into an effective coherence time of two and a half microseconds. So it was, the coherence did not come from the nuclear spins anymore. It came actually from the microwave source. And then we switched on these little side bands that I spoke about. And they have an intensity now that is a thousand times smaller than the primary drive. So I do this. And all of a sudden, I start to see a beating pattern because now I have really a time dependent uh, driving field. Uh, but this beating pattern lasts for a long time now, much longer than, than before. And if, if you look at the analysis, well, you don't see very the, the scale here, but two and a half microseconds is when you have a primary driving field, 
25 microseconds as a coherence time you have when you switch on this field that is 1,000 times weaker than the primary field. So just a small addition can make a huge difference to your coherence time. Here. So, and with these tools, then one can really put everything together and also start and polarize such thin layers here inside of diamond and be very, very resilient towards experimental imperfections. Yeah? And so what we have done here is indeed we, look, we basically we ran a polarization sequence like I showed you before, and every time we looked, did the NV center transfer polarization to the nuclear spins or did it, re did it remain in the state it was in? And in this way, we could count the number of you know, energy exchanges that we had with this uh, polarization bath. And of course, at the beginning, when the carbon 13s are not polarized, there's a lot of polar polarization transfer po probability, but then it decays quite rapidly and it saturates off because the the, when the nuclear spins are polarized, they are all in one direction, the NV center is polarized in this direction, there's no exchange anywhere, there's no dynamics happen. So this shows us in the first step that there's probably polarization transfer, but then you actually want to prove this really, and so what you do is you switch the polarization procedure. Now you start with a spin up in the electron spin, and so you try and polarize all the nuclear spins in the opposite direction, and that's what you see here. Then when you have, you have the polarization here, you flip this up, and all of a sudden you start pr transferring polarization again, but now in the opposite direction. So now putting all this together, and this is coming to the end, um, we polarize the nuclear spins at the beginning. They are pointing in one direction, all of them. And we do this by first decoupling the nuclear spins from each other by driving a strong driving field. They are now uncoupled in their uncoupled ground state, all polarized in the same direction. Then we gradually switch off these driving fields and allow the spins to couple again. And if we do this slow enough, then we go from the non-interacting ground state to the interacting ground state of the system. And therefore, we can actually transfer the system from a boring product state to something that actually represents different quantum phases of different Hamiltonian, depending on which direction in, uh, in the system I go to. Then I can measure all this system and I can, um, I can um, uh, examine, for example, the magnetization of this nuclear spin system using the NV center. And therefore, I have built really a system that can study the dynamics of small quantum magnets that con con uh, are constituted of maybe a few hundred or so atoms. And with that, I would like to close. This is partly an idea, but the first demonstrations have been achieved now and uh, it, they look very promising, and we are going in this further in this direction of creating a quantum simulator that would really work at room temperature. But in the process of this work, uh, which started, I mean, as you can see, five years ago or so, in the process of this work, we actually came to realize that there might be something else there that is also useful by simplifying the problem. We now, we don't aim in, in some setting, we don't aim anymore at polarizing such a stationary spin system to 99% uh, polarization or so, we are happy to take a fluid that is not above the diamond, polarize it to maybe a few percent polarization. And this we have also achieved with some of the tricks that I've shown you, and this can actually really be useful uh, in medical imaging where we can overcome the sensitivity limit of nuclear magnetic resonance and magnetic resonance imaging by polarizing a liquid, inject it into the body, and because it is very strongly polarized, it will give a very strong signal back in the MRI machine and therefore allow us to study properties and length scales and concentrations that are inaccessible in other ways. And with that, I would like to close. So that's the team that uh, did the work. I mean, in fact, um, um, uh, most of the work in this respect was done by Eli Schwartz and Benedikt Tratzmüller uh, of the things that I've done here together with Jan Ming Tsai, who used to be a postdoc in my group and now has his own group back home in China. Thank you. Thank you very much.